There we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Nathan Peck. I'm a developer advocate uh, at AWS. And today I'm going to be presenting a session on running high performance database clusters with Kubernetes in Amazon EKS. I'm going to be joined by Yakesa from uh, State Street, who's going to show you an amazing demo of running an extremely high performance Kubernetes cluster uh, using the open source database uh, Vitesse. And you're going to be amazed by how many transactions per second uh, this open source database is able to achieve within Kubernetes. So to get started with, here are some of the other, we're on the second repeat, I'll skip over that. Um, let's talk about the agenda for this session. First, we're gonna talk about some of the best practices of designing for performance in Kubernetes. We're gonna talk a little bit about how we can test performance, and then we're gonna show that uh, demo of a highly optimized Kubernetes cluster with some of the tips and tricks along the way um, and applications of the optimization principles that we discussed earlier in the uh, slide deck. So let's start with those best practices of designing for performance in Kubernetes. And to level set everybody, let's talk about the basic core components of Kubernetes. Um, if you're familiar with container orchestration, you'll understand that you have your Docker container, which represents your application. You have worker nodes, which are ultimately the machines that will be running your application uh, and the container that wraps around your application. And then you have, in the Kubernetes world, uh, the control plane, which is what tells those worker nodes what application to run and launches, updates, shuts down your containers across those worker nodes. And you have etcd, which is also part of the control plane, but which keeps track of the state of everything that's going on inside of your cluster. And you'll notice I've grouped these into two different categories, the U category and the Amazon EKS category. So with Amazon EKS uh, Kubernetes, uh, the U category is all the things that you are responsible for optimizing um, in order to get that high performance out of your Kubernetes. You need to optimize your container and you need to optimize your usage of the worker nodes and really optimize the worker nodes themselves versus Amazon EKS and the AWS team behind it are responsible for optimizing everything on that right-hand side of the slide, um, everything having to do with the control plane and the etcd itself to really make sure that that uh, stays high performance for you. So let's start with the first aspect that you can uh, optimize inside of your Kubernetes cluster, and that is your container. And the first tip for optimizing your workload in Kubernetes is to keep that container small. There's a couple different ways you can do this. One of my favorite ways is to use a multi-stage Docker build. And what this allows you to do is break out your Docker file into multiple containers which build one after another, but only the last stage of the build, the last final container, is what actually gets run uh, when you deploy something onto your Kubernetes cluster. So to give you an example of how this might work, let's say I have a Java application or let's say a Node.js application, and there's a build and compile phase to constructing my application. If it's Node.js, I need to go out to NPM, I need to fetch my dependencies in and make sure they're available to my application. If it's Java, maybe we need to uh, build the jar file. Um, if it's maybe a C++ or Go application, I actually need to compile that application down to the binary. So stage number one can be the stage that actually hosts my compiler and all my build tools. And then the final stage of my build is uh, actually just copying out the build product from my first stage. And what this results in is you have a very small lightweight container, which is going to be much more efficient when it's deployed uh, across your cluster versus uh, actually distributing all your build tools and your full tool chain to your entire Kubernetes cluster uh, and all the pods that are within it. And the other thing you can do is you can use a minimalist op operating system. Uh, there's a lot of different choices for uh, Docker container operating systems out there. I would recommend using one like Alpine Linux or if you're fortunate to be building in a language like Go where you can build a statically linked binary, you may not need an operating system at all. You may be able to distribute uh, a very even more lightweight container. Also consider, in terms of uh, optimizing your performance in your Kubernetes cluster, what runtime you're using, because not all runtimes are equal. Um, in particular, we noticed that some uh, Spring applications uh, and some frameworks, they have a very strong cold start where they require a lot of resources, an initial burst of resources before they're up and running. And this tends to make it really hard to optimize that Kubernetes cluster compared to a runtime that is more lightweight and starts up uh, much faster. Just to give you an idea about 
what is uh, possible in terms of optimizing your container. Here's a list of popular base images that are in use uh, today. I pulled this uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you'll notice that the baseline Node.js uh, image is <laughs> almost uh, 675 megabytes in size. But you'll notice there's also a Node Slim image, which is 184 megabytes in size. And you'll notice all the way down there at the bottom, the Alpine image that I mentioned earlier, only four megabytes. And there's even a BusyBox image, which is just over one megabyte in size. And so if you're, if you're capable of doing so, try to make use of the most minimalist um, image that's available to you on this list. Um, because the smaller you're able to, to make that runtime, the less memory, the less CPU, the less overhead there's going to be um, in terms of running your application on your Kubernetes cluster. So let's, look, let's step up one level from the container uh, and look at the Kubernetes pod. Uh, the pod is basically the wrapper around your application container when it's running inside your Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can run one or more containers inside the pod, and the Kubernetes control plane schedules the pod as that set of containers onto the hosts inside of your cluster. So the question I always uh, ask people who are suffering from uh, performance issues is how many sidecars are you running in your pod? Um, there's a lot of frameworks out there that add admission controllers to your Kubernetes uh, control plane. And these make it very easy to go ahead and add another sidecar to all your pods. And it becomes a little bit of a hidden cost. Um, you think, oh, I'm just deploying my application. And you don't realize, well, now I'm also deploying two or three, maybe even four sidecar containers alongside each of my uh, one application containers. And it becomes this hidden cost, this hidden overhead that can stack up. So don't underestimate that. Uh, make sure that if you are using sidecar containers, they're very lightweight, they're very efficient sidecar containers and not heavy ones. And if you can, try to avoid sidecars um, to keep those pods as lightweight as possible if you're running something that really requires uh, blazing fast performance. Now, once you've optimized your pods, let's look, take a look at pod placement. So this is controlling um, how that pod gets distributed across your cluster. And one of the first tools that you have in order to do that is resource constraints. So resource constraints allow you to set um, what your intended average utilization of resources such as CPU and memory are for that pod. And you can put an upper limit on how many resources you want that pod to be able to reach up to without going over. The reason why this is important is because when you're running a busy Kubernetes cluster that has a lot of different services, perhaps multiple different types of services, you don't want to run the risk that one pod is going to uh, start starving the other pods uh, by using up all the CPU on a box, because that's a major performance killer. So using uh, limits on, and requests within your pod will guarantee not only that your application pod has this baseline level of resources that it requires, but also that it can't intrude and take resources from other pods that may be running um, uh, co-located on a host uh, in the cluster. Now, related to this, it's important to take a look at the density of your pods. So if you look at these two different configurations, you'll notice that on the left-hand side, we're running four copies of, of a pod, each with half a CPU and 256 megabytes of memory. On the right, we're running two copies of the same pod, but each with one CPU and 512 megabytes of memory. And if you do the math, uh, in both scenarios, the application as a whole is, has access to the same amount of resources overall. But the difference is in how those resources are carved up and distributed and the number of pods that are using those resources. Now, the reason why this is important is that uh, some runtimes actually function better when you give them more and more resources. Some runtimes um, function better when you run more copies and more processes in parallel with each other, but with a fewer amount of resources. In particular, we tend to see this with interpreted languages and languages that have a garbage collector loop. Um, a lot of times, uh, for example, if you have a Node.js application, it'll function really well if you give it one CPU. If you try to give it two or three CPUs, um, it's a single-threaded uh, uh, event loop, basically. So, uh, it may be able to use slightly more than one, one CPU uh, for background uh, uh, threads, but it's not really going to be able to make full use if you just give it uh, one process running on a, a large box or with a large amount of CPU. And in fact, the more requests that you throw into an interpreted language that is uh, dynamically typed, a lot of times you'll see the garbage uh, collector pressure builds up and performance starts to suffer. And in that scenario, you may choose instead to run 
multiple small pods uh, so that way each of them has less garbage collector pressure. Another tool in your toolbox uh, for optimizing your Kubernetes performance is anti-affinity. So anti-affinity constraints, what they allow you to do is keep heavy CPU using pods away from each other so they don't interfere with each other. Um, you may choose to say, I would like my web uh, pod, uh, which is maybe hosting and delivering my web page, to be separate from my API tier, which is the background tier of my application, just in case heavy CPU spikes on one. It won't have the chance of interfering with uh, my other processes that are running uh, a different tier of my application. Now, one warning about this is that pre-Kubernetes 1.12, and these anti-affinity rules, they put a major uh, burden on the control plane itself, especially in a large cluster with a lot of different pods, because it's not very well optimized. It has to go in and query every machine and find out the list of pods. Um, that will be fixed in Kubernetes 112 uh, once you upgrade, and you'll get 100 times better performance on that. Uh, but even if you're not running Kubernetes 1.12 yet, uh, you will maybe find that there's a, there's a good trade-off there that the anti-affinity rule gives you more benefit than it will load on the control plane, um, especially if you don't have a lot of churn in your cluster, a lot of turnover of pods. So once you optimize your pods and you, you set up all these different rules like the anti-affinity and the resource constraints, it's important to actually observe the performance and make sure that everything is behaving as you expect. So I want to show this diagram, which is sort of the, the, uh, the graph, the, the overall map of the tools that are available to you to monitor your performance. You'll notice it all starts with the data model, um, how you're going to model those stats. Uh, there's a, very, a variety of different sources of stats, uh, stats from the nodes themselves, uh, such as how much CPU and memory and disk pressure uh, are, is on that node. Um, for the individual, individual pods and containers, they have their own stats, um, and your application itself may expose different stats. Like if you're Node.js, you may be able to hook into the garbage collector stats. Uh, Java, you may be able to use the GMX uh, stats and get those out of your application. Now, you're gonna wanna take all those stats, give them into some sort of um, statistics aggregator. You're gonna be able to wanna set up uh, alerting on those stats. So if one of them spikes or goes over a certain threshold you uh, establish, you're gonna wanna know about that. And it's also important to be able to visualize those stats. So later in the demo, you're going to see uh, Grafana in action uh, as one of the tools that will help you to uh, observe your performance within the cluster. So looking at all of the pod um, optimizations that are possible, let's look, move to the next level, which is the worker nodes. Um, optimizing your worker nodes starts with making sure that you're on the latest uh, generation of EC2 instance. And a lot of people, they underestimate just how much more performance uh, for price that you get by moving to the latest generation, and they'll end up sticking around on an older version of an EC2 instance because they, they, they're like, well, maybe it's not worth the effort to migrate my cluster over. Well, it's definitely not true. You'll actually find out that the C5 instance that was released has 25% better, 25 better price performance than the C4 instance that came before it. And so what this means is that your application gets 25% faster, you can run maybe 25% more pods within that cluster. Um, so definitely make sure you're running that latest generation of hardware. And choose the hardware that best fits the needs of your application stack. Um, in general, you'll find out that the C instances there tend to be optimized for heavy CPU load. Um, R instances are optimized for heavy, heavy memory usage. Uh, M instances are just general purpose if you use memory and CPU or you have a mix of some workloads that require lots of CPU and some require lots of memory. And P instances are obviously optimized for GPU-powered machine learning. So consider what you're running in the cluster and try to make sure that your cluster uh, is optimized to have an instance that has the resources that your applications actually require. Now, moving on to the control plane, the important thing to understand about EKS is that the, the Kubernetes control plane is optimized by the EKS team when you're using Amazon EKS. And the way it works is I'm able to set up my kube control command line tool and connect to a cluster endpoint that is hosted by Amazon EKS and has a Kubernetes control plane behind it. And then I'm able to provision my worker nodes and add them to that control plane. And uh, I'm responsible for optimizing my application in the worker nodes, uh, 
but that control plane that's hidden behind that cluster endpoint is completely hands-off for me. The Amazon EKS team is responsible for making sure that it performs well. And let's talk about some of the ways that the EKS team has optimized the Kubernetes control plane for you on AWS. And the first I want to introduce is the Amazon uh, AWS VPC CNI plugin. And really what this does is it allows your pods that are running in your cluster to have native IP addresses attached to elastic network interfaces in your VPC on your account. And the reason why this is important is that it creates a very thin layer that has almost no overhead when one pod needs to talk to another pod in the cluster. There are other ways to do this with network overlays, but they tend to be software overlays that run on the instances, and there's gonna be extra uh, components in the middle that are handling that traffic and routing it and adding overhead and adding extra milliseconds of, 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 or microseconds of latency. So with the VPC CNI plugin, that all goes away because you have a real uh, network interface that gets attached to your EC2 instance. The pod is mapped to that, and then the pod is able to talk to another pod using a real IP address that lives in that VPC. So here's how it works. Um, I have pod on one machine, and it has its own route table and Elastic Network Interface. Uh, it communicates out through the Elastic Network Interface through, directly through the VPC uh, fabric. I don't have any other appliances or things sitting there in the middle. And then it goes directly into the Elastic Network Interface of the other pod and to the pod uh, that's actually running on that machine. Now when we talk about the Kubernetes control plane, uh, I want you to think about the Kubernetes uh, performance envelope. There's a lot of different factors that go into uh, performance of your Kubernetes cluster, and in particular, performance of the control plane. And you'll see that some of the major ones are the number of nodes in your cluster. Obviously, the more machines that you put into your cluster, uh, the more burden the cluster is gonna be under keeping track of all of those machines and their states. The number of active namespaces that you use uh, is also a contributing factor. Uh, the amount that you have pod churn, and what I mean by that is pods that exit and then uh, maybe get restarted, or very short-lived pods, or you have a very busy CI-CD pipeline where you're constantly pushing out new updates uh, that cause pods to be rolled out. Uh, pod density, so what this means is how many pods are you stuffing onto each node? Uh, networking, uh, obviously the AWS uh, C9 plugin is designed to have very low networking overhead, uh, but somewhere you're still gonna have to keep track of all of those pods, and that ends up being the IP tables, and that puts extra burden on your Kubernetes cluster. Anti-affinity, as we mentioned before, uh, pre-Kubernetes 1.12, anti-affinity rules can put a major burden on your cluster, particularly if they're combined with that high pod churn. And secrets. Now, let's look at a couple different scenarios. In this scenario, we're running heavy monolithic pods in a very large cluster. And what I mean by that is uh, maybe we're running a pod which is almost the same size or actually the very same size as the instance. So in some cases, customers come to us and they have a monolithic application. They're not quite ready to move to microservices. And so really what they are, want to use Kubernetes for is to distribute this monolithic pod to a large cluster of instances and just use it as a mechanism for rolling that, that application out to the cluster. And so they're running one giant pod per instance, but they have a very large number of instances. And so in that case, the performance envelope is gonna look something like this. That number of nodes is gonna be a major contributing factor, particularly if you have thousands or even tens of thousands of nodes that you would like to run. Uh, you may notice that uh, Kubernetes has some guidelines on how many nodes the Kubernetes control plane is capable of uh, handling. And EKS team is constantly trying to push that to the next level, particularly for our customers that have a very large number of nodes they need to run. And um, in that case, with a large number of nodes comes a large anti-affinity burden if you happen to be running multiple different types of uh, pods that are the same size as a node. Now the picture changes if we have to be running microservice pods uh, that are bin packed onto nodes. In that case, uh, perhaps this is a, a startup that has really gone all in on microservices and so they have very intense pod density. They're, they're running microservices that have maybe a, a quarter of a CPU per microservice, uh, but they're running many of them. So they're running instances that have 20, 30 pods per instance. 
And because it's not a monolithic application, there's more crosstalk between services. So there's gonna be a lot more networking overhead. There's gonna be a lot more items in that pod uh, um, IP table lookup. And with microservices, there tends to come a lot more pod churn as well um, because microservices lend themselves well to CID, CICD pipelines where people are constantly updating the code and pushing out new versions of stuff. So this is gonna create a different type of load on the Kubernetes control plane. So when you consider these two different scenarios, you'll see that optimizing the control plane is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Fortunately, the Amazon EKS team is here to help you optimize your control plane to your specific needs. So we're constantly, lear constantly learning and adjusting our models and our techniques for optimizing Kubernetes control plane to your specific needs. And um, we're, we're here to help you. If you run into an issue with your Kubernetes control plane where you feel like you should be able to get more performance or you want to push one of those limits, um, definitely reach out to the EKS team via support ticket. Um, they're happy to look into your Kubernetes cluster and determine the exact performance needs and tune it uh, to those needs. So let's move on now to the demo from State Street. Um, Yakesa from State Street is going to show a high performance database running on an Amazon EKS. Thank you, Nathan. How are you guys doing? Good conference? What's your favorite part? Kubernetes? Okay. I, I love this uh, deep racer toy. That's my Christmas present, if I can order one and get one before that time. Uh, I can't wait to uh, I wrap my hands around this. I'm from State Street. My name is Akesa. And here's a quick disclaimer. Uh, what this means is uh, the opinions expressed here are my own. And uh, the pro State Street as a company does not endorse any products that uh, I may present. All right. <clears throat> so I was skeptical at first when I started looking at deploying databases to Kubernetes. Kubernetes was originally promoted for stateless applications. So, and the databases are a complex state machine. So how do you fit the most complex state machine onto a completely stateless system, at least up until the 1516 Kubernetes? That's where I started. So I'm gonna walk you through what we did, how we did it, and why we did it. And I'm gonna touch upon some of the best practices uh, that we learned over, along the way. And then I'm gonna um, show you some of the impediments we ran into and how did we overcome. To put my skepticism to test, we just said we planned a demo for you, right? And what we're gonna do is, if you can help us, we'll all push the database very hard, so hard, and let's see if it can actually do a million queries per second. I don't know what it can do, but let's figure that out. All right, so what and why, I'll keep this very simple. What is, what we intended to do was to build a transactional database transactional database that can scale unlimited. See, there's a lot of managed databases, there's commercial database vendors, there's a lot of solutions out there, so why are you building a database is a very common question I get. Well, you gotta scale unlimited and cost effectively, right? And a lot of the databases have some problems somewhere, whether it's right throughput or single master or you know, there's many kinds of different limitations that you experience. So we wanted to break through those barriers and have a system that can scale unlimited with high concurrency and low latencies, okay? And then we wanted it to be open source because financial workloads can certainly leverage deep analytics within the database. And a lot of the general purpose databases aren't there yet but we want to get the basics right, so the foundations are running solid, then we start to go inside the deeper into the engine. That's the intent, okay? So, and then we wanted to embrace the cloud native architecture, um, so we can quickly recover from failures. And, you know, if you can imagine, if you can create a database that can recover quickly, then you can, you know, uh, then, you know, you can deploy this to cloud at scale so recovery is not an issue. 
I just want to spend a minute or two brushing through the high-level database basics so you can appreciate the complexities involved in this database system. Most of you might be familiar uh, with an architecture like this, right? This is 10, 15, 20-year-old architecture. Why am I showing that? I just want to highlight some of the complexities involved and how we might map those complexities to Kubernetes. The master-slave architecture, there's a master, and then uh, th that's where you write to, and then it replicates down to its slaves, right? And then you can use any database engine. If those of you who are familiar with MySQL, there's InnoDB, there's MyISAM, there's many database engines out there. I like RocksDB. RocksDB comes from Facebook. It's a predecessor to, um, not predecessor, successor to LevelDB, um, and this works really well for write-intensive workloads because of its LSM data structure, which is highly optimized. It takes every single update and converts it into a, um, an append-only write. And it also consumes very little memory, and I will show you that in the demo. So for those reasons, I actually like RocksDB. You can use MariaDB or Percona, which are both open source databases. I haven't listed MySQL here because MySQL does not support RocksDB. And you can use pretty much any of the other MySQL standard features. For those of you who understand this synchronous, semi-synchronous replication, all those features are fully, you know, you can leverage them. All right, so cloud native. I'm gonna really just touch a little bit on this one. So what this means is, if you look at any given database instance, that's the, you know, zooming into the database instance. You have a Percona layer on the top, writing through MyRox into RoxDB. RoxDB is the one that is generating the data files, the SST files, that are then synchronized into S3 for recovery purpose, okay? All right, so the picture that I showed you in the last slide is a master scale. The typical issues you have in that architecture is to scale out the reads, you add more slaves. But to scale out the writes, you do what? Nothing, right? In that architecture diagram, you are limited by what one writer can do. So I went looking for solutions. So if you think about how key value stores have done it, they've done it, they came up with the sharding mechanisms. So if you envision each master slave is a shard. You just keep on adding shards to get the scale up. And this is exactly what Vitesse does. Vitesse is an open source from uh, YouTube, Google, and uh, it works wonderfully in the scale out option, and it's ACID compliant. I, I highlighted it as in yellow because it's kind of, there is some trade offs that you need to know if you are interested in exploring that. This system has been deployed here on, on Amazon S3 and EKS. So when a transaction comes from the end user, it goes to, there's two architectural elements here that are important. One is VT gate, the other one is VT tablet. VT, somebody has to assume routing decisions when you have sharded databases, and that's the VT gate. It's like a router. And then VT tablet wraps the database instances. It does many things like taking continuous backups, continuous recovery. Because if you have never tested your backup, God only knows if it actually works. So this system actually does continuous backups and continuous recovery. And then it also prevents, if you want, you can prevent heavy duty queries from hitting OLTP systems. OLTP systems are latency sensitive. You cannot take a long time to respond because guess what, the user is waiting. It's not an analytics system. So if you want to prevent analytics systems or queries hitting hard on OLTP systems, you can put in some protections. All right. So, and then when a transaction comes in, the master forwards it on to the slaves for replication purpose. Let's take a pause and look at the complexities in this, in this diagram. There's many points of failure here, right? There's many, many pods running. Slaves can go, masters can die. The router layers can die. The backups that are go happening back into the S3, they can fail at any time. So this is a very complex state machine, right? 
there's east-west traffic, masters talking to slaves, and routers talking to the different shards. There's north-south traffic, um, so parts talking to parts, and then clients talking to the system. So now let's figure out how we'd build this on Kubernetes. I start with the very basics. Databases have state, persistence, right? You're storing some data, it needs to be persisted somewhere, and that's where the storage comes in. We leverage persistent volumes to uh, store the data. When I'm talking about data, these are the data files that database creates on, you know, when you're in doing inserts and, and all that, so it's, the data is going somewhere. That's the storage. So we leverage the combination of PV, persistent volumes, and persistent volume claims to abstract the low-level details. Cluster administrators configure the file systems and other low-level uh, things, and we just submit claims to get the storage we want. You request the access mode and the amount of storage you want to the PV claims. There are several ways to attach a data, a data volume to your pod. One is embed within the container or the pod. The problem with this one, there's no resiliency. If you take the container down for whatever purpose, you want to patch the software, update a configuration, you lost the data. When you have databases at scale, you don't want to lose the data so quickly. So you want to have a little bit persistence. So one option is to store the persistent volume outside the pod so it can survive pod restarts. That's the, now this is medium resiliency because at least now you have the ability to recycle the pod. But, and it gives you the best performance because it's local persistent volume. It gives you the best performance. Now, there's also a third option, which is a cloud-based volumes, EBS, NFS. Now, this thing is another option if you want. For some applications, it may work great. Your mileage may vary. For databases, this is not the option I choose. I choose the middle one. I'm not so worried about the resiliency because I got master slaves, so I got data on other nodes too. How else can we get the most out of the Kubernetes system? Taints and tolerations are the first thing. When you're running databases, you want predictable performance, right? Very reliable performance. If a query does milliseconds today and takes minutes tomorrow, you're not going to have happy customers. You got to make sure that you're delivering consistent performance. So one way to do it is, of course, taint the nodes. In other words, you are disallowing or not allowing other applications from deploying to your cluster. You can carve out a subset of your cluster and through taints and tolerations and deploy your application, the databases, to just that subset of nodes. This is where the node affinity comes in. By attaching labels, you can pick and choose where you want to deploy. Now, for example, by tainting the nodes, you can use either kubectl commands or EKS supports Packer scripts, bootstrap scripts. You can put the commands inside those scripts to taint the node. Affinity is, applies at two levels, part affinity, node affinity. Part affinity is if you have a client who is generating a lot of writes into this database, you might want to co-host them together so you avoid some of the network communication or overheads. So that's part affinity. The net node affinity is I might want to deploy the databases only to SSD machines, right? Not all machines might have SSDs on them. Anti-affinity is just as useful. I don't want to deploy master and slave on the same node. Why? Because if a node goes down, then I lost a significant chunk of the database in the master-slave architecture. So you, can, you have lots of bells and whistles to play with this to give you a very controlled environment. And then the services, this is the cluster IP node port, and we're going to touch on this one later on during the demo. Resource requests and limits. So this is, um, as a database guy, I'd like to have, to, I'd like to be able to burst up CPU memories and stuff like that, right? So I don't want to put limits on the database. Database is delivering a very critical, um, you know, system, right? So you don't want to put any limits on this one. But if you don't have that luxury, then you might want to use limits to your advantage. 
and limits apply to both CPUs and memory. They work a little differently. When you put in a limit at the CPU level, it's called compressible. What that means is if you exceed that limit, the system will throttle you. It won't stop you, it will throttle you. With memory, if you put a limit and you exceed the limit, it will kick you out, you are evicted. So be careful when you choose these things. And you may also look at what's the, how is the system, the node configured. If there's lots of requests and limits, you can look at under the conditions of the, uh, each node to see what the limit, how the limits and requests have been set up already. So you can get a sense if the system is already overloaded, right? Um, you don't have to panic if it goes over 100%. It doesn't mean that that's, how, that's the utilization. It just shows you what each person that's deploying to this cluster is requesting. CCTL, this is a you know, whole bunch of Linux kernel level optimizations that you might apply. You can still do that. Of course, this is limited to worker nodes. And um, so those are the kind of performance, you know, whatever makes sense to you. I got a whole bunch of recommendations on the CCTL, but um, it may not be generally transferable, but you know, I'm happy to share. Stateful sets, operators and daemon sets are not directly a performance related, but I'm gonna touch upon that very high level. So stateful set is a successor to replica set and it solves some important key problems, but it also has some limitations. The limitations are if you have to recover a system like the master slave that I just showed you, the master, you know, when the master dies, if you have, then you have to look across all your slaves to figure out which one you're gonna promote. You can't make a random decision. There's like four different things that you gotta do before you say, yeah, this is the guy I wanna promote to the next master. So stateful sets don't have that capability. So this is where the operator comes in. Right, operator is your custom controller. You feed the CRD, custom resource definition, and it will set up an ecosystem of whatever you, services you need, but it also can track the recovery if you, if you have to do some complex recovery of the system. Daemon sets is typically used for your uh, monitoring, right? So I'll show you in the demo that we are using daemon sets for uh, Prometheus, uh, pumping metrics into Prometheus. <clears throat> Some of the best practices that we've learned. Uh, of course, you gotta keep your container lean and mean, right? That's the, uh, get the gunk out of there like Nathan already talked about. You know, Alpine is a good choice if you wanna use that. EK is uh, optimized AMI. It comes, it's uh, Amazon Linux 2 and ENAs and all that built in, so take advantage of that. Image pool policy. You want to sp spend some time thinking about this, especially if you're, going to, if you're planning large-scale clusters. Uh, you don't know where you'll be throttled. So test this out, think about it ahead of time, how you're going to roll this out. Uh, the next two points are uh, typical database recommendations. You want to run masters on, uh, on, on SSDs because you want that throughput, you want that performance. So that's what I recommend. And for the slaves, if you are using semi-synchronous replication, what that basically means is uh, when you have a transaction come in, you want that transaction to be replicated at least on another slave before the transaction is acknowledged to the client. That's called semi-synchronous replication in, in MySQL. And if you use that, then the slave has to run at the same speed as the master. So for that purpose, you should pick symmetric hardware. But if you want increased resiliency, you can also run some of the slaves on EBS attached volumes. So you'll get a little bit more uh, resiliency. And um, monitoring, of course, is the key, right? Otherwise, you don't know uh, how, you know, you're flying blind. And then the uh, autoscalers, there's three types. Um, you know, they're all making sure that you have enough resources in the system. Cluster autoscaler is making sure that you have enough EC2 worker nodes. Horizontal pod autoscaler works at the pod level, autoscaling up and down. Vertical pod autoscaler, this is coming. I don't think it is supported by EKS yet, but it's coming. It's, um, I'm not sure, you should check. Uh, that's about, if you, if you define limits on a container, and then you find out that you actually needed a little bit more memory than what you initially specified, or what you started out with. Vertical 
part out of scale allows you to expand the limit of the container, right? It's vertically expanded automatically for you. Otherwise, you risk being evicted by Kubernetes. So that's a very useful feature It's coming. Placement groups, <clears throat> this is the single big thing, this is the single most uh, factor that changed our, uh, our throughput in the system. We got a 30% bump in the network throughput or the queries per second, right? Um, by just placing the cluster inside a placement group. So definitely take advantage of that. Now, um, you know, if you're doing multiple placement groups, there are some restrictions that you got to follow, but you know, it's, it's, uh, overall, this is great. Cross AZ deployment, of course, this is for all production systems. You got to deploy across different AZs. And my recommendation is that place writes closer to the master. What that means is in a master slave, like an architecture, if you have that luxury uh, or that flexibility, I would say, then you place your clients who are writing, the, doing the most writes closer to the master. That way, it lives in the same AZ, perhaps the same placement group, you get the best throughput. Choose the right size nodes. Nathan touched up on this one, how you pick your nodes and sizing the nodes. This is absolutely critical. So my recommendation for high throughput systems is pick the one that, has, that gives you the best network performance, right? So we are running, I'll show you the demo, C5D, nine extra large. So this gives us the 10 gigabit per second uh, network throughput. You, and there are other nodes too, but we pick C5s because if it's in a high compute uh, capacity. And then of course you gotta pick the SSDs and you know, there's other variants that you gotta look at. So you gotta pick a node that gives you the best network performance and then small enough so you can fan them out, right? So that's, what's the Goldilocks size? I can't tell you, it depends on your application. Um, in general, these days, you get, you know, so for high throughput systems, I can make a general statement that more CPU is better than more RAM. And you see this with RocksDB engine, for example. RocksDB engine compresses really well. Uh, it's, uh, there's no right amplifications, and the CPU is, you know, you can fully leverage the CPU. And you will see that the memory, um, as it is pushing the load that we're gonna see, the memory stays really low. <clears throat> the CNI plugin, this is absolutely the best thing, right? I don't think I can say of this of any other overlay networks. This runs at VPC speed, no overheads, and we've seen best performance with this CNI. One gotcha is if, one, if you deploy this system with CNI, you gotta make sure you keep it up because w when you create the cluster, whatever version CNI is what you, what you get and that's what stays on. If you want to pick up some uh, updates or fixes, you got to go pull down the latest and greatest and apply it yourself. So there's some maintenance to do. Um, <clears throat> we are using that uh, the CNI G7E, I don't know, what, so you can read that. So bottlenecks, let's talk about one of the important bottlenecks we ran into. Typically when you're running a database at scale, at this throughput, you would expect a memory or a disk to be bottlenecking. That's not where we've seen the issues. The memory was fine, the disk was doing just fine. CPUs were not even at a 80%, right? And we were surprised actually to notice that we were hitting a wall with the packets per second. Let me show you the chart. So if you look at this chart, on the left-hand side bottom, what you're seeing is the network in and out packets per second. Where I have the vertical line, is the million, 6.6 6 million packets per second. We hit a wall right there. And if you can see the chart above, the CPU utilization was at 35%. We have ample capacity on the CPU side. And the network throughput in terms of bytes in and out was actually dropped at the same exact second where we hit the wall. This is where we called EKS team for help. They jumped in, they debugged, and they provided a solution. They said, turn on jumbo frames. And that's where we went to GitHub, downloaded the CNI patch, and applied to this uh, EKS cluster. We saw a huge jump. So here is how we scaled. So first, when we deployed a cluster, um, the database cluster, two shards, four nodes, we were overloaded. That was completely databases were just running hot 
So we said, let's expand the cluster size, and then we added uh, three subnets, and then we saw a, a throughput jump to 400 kilo, uh, queries per 400,000 queries per second. But of course, that was not enough. Then we moved it into a placement group, uh, and the first time you were seeing 1.5 MTU, because I'm about to make a reference to jumbo frames. So this was standard configuration with CNI, 1.5 MTU, and we um, were able to push about 600,000 queries per second. And that was not enough. And that's where, you see, we, uh, by, place, by putting it in a placement group, the network packets per second jumped up to 9.5 million. So we saw a huge increase by hosting this inside a placement group. But then we realized that this is where we are stalling. No matter what we did after this, we could not go past this throughput. So that's when the EKS team gave us the help, and we downloaded the jumbo frames. That got us to 948,000 queries per second. At still doing, I have a typo there. That's not 500 nanos. That's 500 micros. I apologize for that mistake. Um, so, so that's where we ended up. And then we realized that now we have a bigger package. Jumbo packets is 9, 9K um, bytes. So then we realized that, wait a second, now all of a sudden we got 9K size and 9.5 and nine million packets uh, that we can push per second. Why don't we pack more densely? So we added more replicas. When we added more replicas, the system was handling, the network was just fine, and we were able to push it up to 1.36 million requests per second. Let's see this in action. I need your help. So if you could pull up your uh, phone and, um, and go to dbas, D-B-A-A-S dot site. I'd like you to submit a job. So I'm going to run the jobs right here. So we'll, we'll collectively push the system very hard. So I'm going to log in here. Can you see my screen? No, sorry. Not switching. Okay, good. All right. So the dashboard on the left hand side is Grafana. It is put together from Prometheus and CloudWatch metrics. You'll see some you know mix of both. The gauge on the top is the queries per second. That's the absolute one to watch. And then there is a query latencies, which is right here. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. So that's the query latencies. A high performance system is a system that can push high throughput with low latencies. So one number has to be really high, other number has to be really low. That's when we know it's a high performance system. So let's kick some tires. <clears throat> or dbas, D-B-A-A-S dot site, S-I-T-E. It's not going? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. So let me quickly introduce you to the system. So what we have is a 30-node uh, cluster. It's running C5, 9 extra D. Um, I fat finger all the time, so I kind of created a script for myself and a make file, so I don't make too many mistakes here. And the pod count is about 169, so there's about 169 pods running on 30 nodes. And uh, of course, this system, as you can see, there's so many daemon sets, deployment services, so it's very hard to do this by hand, so we created a CRD, and the CRD basically is the operator, right? So and then it, the combination of CRD and the operator is what creates that system. And it goes to the uh, you know, standard SDLC pipeline and, and GitHub and all that. So with that, let me actually run some load on this system. I'm going to start off slowly. So what I just did is I'm submitting a MySQL sysbench job. For those of you who are familiar with MySQL community or MySQL, you know sysbench job. So we are running OLTP 
select, OLTP point select. A point select basically means you are looking up a record by its primary key, and then a point update means you are updating the record using its primary key. So we are running OLTP, point select, and point update. That's basically what's going on here. I'm going to run a whole bunch of jobs to keep the system busy. So how are we doing? So we have about 552,000 transactions per second, or queries per second, right? That's not enough. It's, that's, anybody can do that. Let's kick it a little bit harder. So if you guys have submitted your jobs, I'm going to go run them myself here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what's going on. <clears throat> so on the bottom screen, you can see all the jobs that are currently running. So job is basically a standard Kubernetes job. And uh, I'm not going to show you the, the, uh, in the interest of time, but it's basically a Kubernetes job, right? So it's running n number of parallel, uh, parallel jobs with n number of threads, right? So think of it that way. All right, there you go. It actually crossed 1.2 million transactions a second. So we're going to kick it even harder, guys. So, all right. So it's running more jobs now. So that's about 1.142. It goes back and forth a little bit. Now let's look at the query latencies, and then I want to call out the network performance here. So if you can see the network performance, uh, we are at about network in and out. It's about 4 million uh, packets per second. We are about 1.46, right? I want it to go to 1.5. Let's see if that happens. Uh, keep watching. And then what I'm going to do is thank you for submitting the jobs. I'm going to run all of your jobs right now. All the jobs that you guys have submitted, thank you. Wow, that's a lot of jobs. Thank you. So let's see how the system does. Uh, all right, 1.5, bingo, guys. Right, we were hoping to see a million. 1.585. Thank you. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the majority of the uh, demo I wanted to show you. And it's running about eight shards in the system, each shard having one master, three replicas. That means four database instances uh, replicated eight times over, or eight shards, right? So that is 32 database instances powering this instance here, the, powering this system, right? And then let me quickly show you. Uh, 1.6, oh my god, look at that. This is the first time I'm seeing 1.6. That's great. On, on, on this is the system here. That's exciting. You know what? I'm in the mood. Let's go ahead and push it even harder. Is it make right or make rights? All right, there you go. Let's see. And, and one thing I wanted to show you here is that the, uh, the latencies, right? So this is all the way in the bottom here. It is 4.7 milliseconds for P90. Okay, 90th percentile latency is 4.7 milliseconds when the system is running at that speed, right? And the P50, I can't even read this number, it's so below. It's, a, it's, a, it's a about 90, somewhere, 940 micros or something like that. I don't know what that is, but I, I can't do the math right now. But as you can see, it is consistently hitting 1.5, 1.6 million transactions a second. So with that said, um, what I'll do is I'll actually um, stop it here, and I'll take questions. I think it will be more useful for you guys. The, uh, one thing is I want to switch back and... Uh, Okay, I, I got one more slide to show, I think. All right, so, oh, thank you. <laughs> and Please don't forget to turn in your uh, session surveys. Yeah, please fill out your session service. It's very important. You know, and if you have any Q&A, please come up and talk to us afterwards. And enjoy the rest of the conference, guys. Thank you.